So welcome everybody. Welcome to our ecology and evolution um, seminar series. Welcome to our very first um, Zoom, so online seminar. Thanks to um, Bowie for helping to get that happening so that we can um, record it. So just a note for everybody to know that we are recording this on Zoom and then we will be uploading um, the Zoom recording onto our Sciences YouTube so that Diego's family can see it and also everyone else can log on to that. So mm -hmm. yeah, so very exciting. So yeah, so welcome to our, the last of our seminars for our autumn series. So the last of our threatened species seminars and Diego Guevara is presenting today and Diego is um, presenting on his PhD work including um, some work in threatened grasslands. So I'm just trying to flick on to my next slide for you. There we are. So hopefully you can see that. So we, um, we're hearing in a minute from Diego for about 20 minutes on his PhD and then uh, we'll be having some time to um, have a bit of a happy hour and um, Bowie's going to be taking us, we're going to do a bit of a, um, a feedback and some thinking together, just informal thinking with some polls and um, also some breakout rooms, thinking about this seminar series and putting them online and how some suggestions for that and opportunity for feedback. We'd love to hear people's thoughts on, on how we could do this. Um, so any suggestions are really, really welcome. Okay, so Diego, I will hand over to you. So you should hopefully now be able to share your screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yep, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So, well, hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Diego Guevara from the Plant Terrestrial Ecology Lab on the Uni of Adelaide. And I will be talking about the factors that control invasive and native grassland species from Mediterranean type climate regions of South Australia. What is the first thing that comes to your mind uh, when someone mentions grasslands? Probably cattle grazing pasture. But actually these are important ecosystems that provide uh, a good amount of ecosystem services. But I want you to focus today on their ecolo ecological importance. And they host a great biodiversity and in South Australia, there are a good amount of endemic species that depend on them and that they're also endangered. Sadly, uh, most of their extension has been reduce. As you can see in the map, the region we are interested in is the Mediterranean type climate region that is the temporary climate region. You can call them temporary grasslands and um, the color we want to see is this light green and there is not much left actually only 0.5 percent of the remaining of their original extension has been Estimated, estimated to remain. So it's a very critical situation for this ecosystem. And this is more or less how it looks the current state of, of things. So on the left side, we, we have Pontirui Conservation Park, uh, which, is, which is dominated by remnant Tuso grasslands. These are perennial uh, grasses and graminoids. And on the le right side, we, we have the Barra Woodlands Nature Reserve, uh, which is an ex land that was overtaken by uh, exotic animal species. And you could see the difference in the pattern, right? There are some soil and the plants are a little bit dispersed while this is completely overrun by, by the wild oats. Uh, and to know a little bit more about this ecosystem, um, let me tell you about the perennial species. Uh, these are two genus that dominate this kind of ecosystem. 
and the perennial species are characterized for having long root systems, uh, a slow growth, and the fact that they persist through the year, while on the other side, we have the annual species that escape the drought season, and they produce biomass mainly during the, the rainy season. And, they, and an important fact is that they, most of them are able to take advantage of resources uh, faster than perennials. And this has allowed them to enter different ecosystems in, in the world and pretty much they, are, they have invaded because they are, most of them are invasive species and they have invaded in several parts of the world as we can see here. How uh, does this happen? Uh, we have to, first we have to know that we have our system and we have uh, energy inputs, uh, water, nutrients, and there's also a salt microbial community that lives with the plants. Uh, but this situation can be disrupted by fluctuations in resources. Uh, for example, agriculture and raising uh, creates inputs of nutrients into the soil, also biomass destruction and, and cost trampling, and that damages the ecosystem and the balance that was achieved by the system before. And the same happens with environmental uh, factors like uh, like rain or droughts that affects the water availability and soil moisture. So these variations in resources create uh, windows of opportunity for exotic species to enter the system. And eventually some of them can become uh, invasive and domain. But apart from this, we have to understand that there are certain or a number of filters that take place in, in the invasion of a species. So first we have the translocation and dispersal filter that is pretty much how the exotic species arrives to the system. And once in the system, we have the abiotic and biotic filters uh, that act on the species pool. And we have our final vegetation community from these filters. And at the same time, while all this is happening, we have to take in consideration that each species have an ecological evolutionary history meaning that some of them could be more aggressive, resistant, and that will facilitate their establishment. So um, the first part of my PhD will have to, will be about the abiotic filters related to climate. We know that annual species do better than perennials in, in zones with a high rainfall seasonality. This is because they are able to take advantage on the water resources faster than the perennials. Uh, but the response of perennial grasses are, and graminoids are not uh, completely clear in a say. Um, there, there is data for some seasons, but there's still much to be done. And we also know that natives that are adapted to drought might resist the invasion in the long term. This is a hypothetical uh, situation. Uh, so this lead led me to the questions that are, what is the response of native perennial grasses to rain seasonality in South Australia? Uh, and if extreme climate events will represent an opportunity for native species in South Australian grasslands? And what is the effect of uh, the variations in, in water availability to, to the soil community? Um, to, to respond to these questions, first I will assess the response of exotic animals and native perennials to rainfall variations by analyzing the temporal dynamics and by calculating the covariance of a leaf area with the amount of rainfall. I expect to detect uh, this kind of pattern uh, for the invasive species with a high peak of biomass production or leaf area cover in, in the rainy season, while the pattern of the uh, native perennials uh, is more discrete. Um, and to do that, uh, I will employ drone imagery and try to see if uh, the patterns I detect can be translocated to satellite imagery to develop a monitoring uh, technique or method. So far, um, I have been exploring uh, Ponte Rui Conservation Park. Uh, this is an image from February this year. And the interesting part of the, the interesting thing about this park is that 
at the bottom, there's a big pandra, which is a perennial graminoid. And the analysis of the image uh, shows that there is some kind of pattern in this area that is different from the area dominated by exotic animals. And that's, uh, that's something good, I believe. The same, the same pattern could be seen in the NDVI. Um, and I have also analyzed this through 2019. And this is a pattern I was telling you. This is for the Lomandra patches. Where we have a, a peak during the rainy season. But the pattern is pretty similar to, to the one for the, to the pattern. Uh, the, the pattern is pretty similar for the exotic annuals, meaning that um, the trend might be true for the exotic annuals, but not necessarily for the perennials. I still need to analyze this better. Um, part of my head that will assess the response of grassland species to fluctuations in water resource caused by prolonged drought and higher rainfall. So I want to see how how these factors affect the community structure and above bio above ground biomass, and at the same time uh, check how the soil nutrient composition and microbial community can change. And to to study this, I, I will construct a rain a rain rain out shelter experiment, which is basically these kind of the structures that allows to to control the amount of water that comes into the plot. And I will have uh, some treatments that are the drought, uh, a drought treatment, um, a higher rainfall treatment with more water into the system, and also a control plot. Uh, so far we, with Hopi, we have uh, been building this prototype and we're trying to replicate the, and adjust the, the experiments that have been done in other parts of the world. Uh, and in, an exciting part of this uh, Research is that we're having uh, doing these experiments all around the world and assessing uh, droughts to different ecosystems. Another part of my PhD will will be about the biotic filters in management. So we already talked about um, why it's important to consider the amount of nutrients in the soil uh, and how these benefits the invasive species. Uh, so in relation to management, we know that the sheep excrete a, a large part of the nutrient elements they ingest, meaning and uh, cattle dung in general creates an input of, resource, of nutrients into the soil. Even to the point that the urine of sheep have been found to induce changes in the soil microbial community. And uh, all, all of this is important because in Australia, sheep are used to control the biomass of invasive species. But at the same time, it could be that this is benefiting the invasive species in, for the next generation because all the dung is left in the, in the soil with all the nutrients. So to explore this, I will assess the influence of, of sheep and kangaroo dung addition to to native perennial and exotic and other species. Uh, I chose the kangaroo because it's a native um, native mammal that fits on grass and we can compare the, the effect with the effect of the, of the sheep that is not native to the system. So I want to determine the recruitment of native perennials after the addition of these two kind of tongue. And I will conduct a glass house experiment uh, employing Avena barbata, which is an, ex an exotic annual grass and the native perennial uh, Ritidosperma auriculatum. And I will also sterilize the down before using it to just constrain the, the experiment to the nutrients. Um, and finally, the last part of my uh, PhD will be about the biotic filters in the soil. But before telling you about what I'm planning to do, I, I need to explain a little bit better this, this topic. So we know that uh, the late successional species uh, are more dependent on mutualisms and are more resistant to pathogens in the system. This is because they have developed a, a good relationship, you could, you could say, 
uh, and they have co-evolved co together. But disruptions like farming, for example, produce changes in the soil community, not only in the nutrients. And, and this, uh, this would have been built through time with the likes of sectional spe uh, species are, are disrupt. Uh, <coughs> and a new uh, soil community is developed. And this could uh, give the opportunity to exotic species to enter the system and invasive species can become dominant. Um, and it's because um, they escape their pathogens, meaning that the pathogens from their original ecosystem are not present in the soil, so they, can, they, they don't have that pressure anymore. Also, the fact that some invasive species accumulate pathogens is lower than the native uh, species in the system, meaning that they have an advantage there. And of course, there are the inherent plant traits. Um, as I told you before, some are more resistant or, or rude, uh, and that could play a, a major role. Um, but with time, invasive species accumulate pathogens anyway. And a coexistence between the invasive species and the native species is established. However, this could take uh, decades. Uh, and that's why people have developed restoration techniques to make things happen faster, especially in exarable lands where there are a lot of uh, soil legacies produced by farming. Uh, there are basically uh, a microbial community influenced by the invasive species, uh, um, a high level of nutrients in the soil, and the exotic seed banks from, from the invasive ones. So to get rid of these legacies, people um, use topsoil removal as, a, as an answer, which is basically removing the topsoil layer of the soil and getting rid of all these legacies at, at, the, at the same time. But it's pretty expensive. Um, in that sense, the soil microbial inoculation uh, could be an alternative, and it has been found to be pretty good in the sense that it promotes the late successional species. What I mean here is that uh, by putting microbes back into the soil, we aim to recover the original microbial uh, community that had good relationships with the late successional species. And that's why this could help us to target those species and bring them back. Our lab, um, Recently, I found that the soil microbial inoculation was pretty effective for um, the establishment of native perennials in a glasshouse experiment, and we want to check this on the, in the field. So I want to know what is the main effect of the scalping of removing all this soil and if microbial inoculation could be an alternative. The purpose, um, I will assess the effects of, of the microbial inoculation and the topsoil removal on on exarable lands. Uh, and I will check the effectiveness of these techniques on the establishment of native perennial grasses, uh, their effectiveness to diminish the invasive species presence in the, in the area, and determine changes in soil availability and see if these changes are positive for the establishment of the native perennials we are interested in. And also, of course, check the differences in soil microbial needs. Um, to do this, I'm from the ex land, the old field. I will also have a treatment with Justin to see how effective it could be by itself. Uh, and a control that will be just the top soil removal and another control that will be no treatment. And for this, I will employ again, Avena Barbata and Ritidosperma auriculatum. The last one, it, it's a pretty popular species to be used in restoration activities. Uh, and the first one, the Avena, is one of the main uh, invasive species in South Australia. Additionally, uh, the last part of the of my research will, will focus in determining the effectiveness of some restoration techniques. So a couple of years ago, Monique Smith in, in 
did a did her PhD in our lab, and she employed uh, topsoil removal along with uh, slashing, fire, and carbon addition to in in Para Woodlands Nature Reserve to check the restoration results of these techniques. And I want to see if the results uh, she found are the same uh, that at the at this at this moment after years so <clears throat> there are not many studies that have a study that have uh, done research on on the long-term results of restoration and the idea is to see if the perennials are still there or if it has become again a system dominated by by avena by the invasive ones so i hope that my research will improve the management and restoration of native grasslands in the state and um, I would like to thank my supervisor, Jose Pacelli, and my co-supervisor, Bertrand Austenford, as well as the University of Adelaide for giving me the opportunity to conduct this research. And the Department of Environment and Water, Water and Natural Resources of South Australia, as well as Nature Foundation for their support and interest to me. Thanks. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Thank Anne, you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah, so Diego, we have um, one question um, to start with from Roy. Question or I don't know. Maybe there is no question. There are no yeah. questions, perhaps. Yeah, okay, Roy is just unmuted now. Uh, while we're waiting for Roy then perhaps to find his voice, does anybody else have a question for Diego? You can write the questions down or if you raise your hand, I can unmute you. I'll just get Melita there, I just saw. Um, great talk. Um, I'm just wondering whether um, with your um, plastic covers, whether you expect there to be any um, like changes in humidity um, caused from like the sun on the plastic and if that's gonna, you reckon that might have any effect? Um, yeah, that's, that's the challenging, challenging part of, the, of, of that experiment, the design of the shelters. Uh, so the ones we are aiming to build have, um, 50% cover, meaning that not all the roof is, is covered. So you will have uh, spaces within the, the layers of plastic that will somehow counter the, the possibility of um, water gathering below the plastic and producing um, a greenhouse effect inside the, the plot. Okay. Um, other uh, other projects that have employed this kind of, the same design they haven't found a significant effect a greenhouse effect so we are aiming to, to achieve that yeah oh, that's good good yeah thanks <laughs> um Diego, question about the extreme spatial heterogeneity in that landscape how are you going to tackle that? Are you looking at different slopes or trying to do everything on a similar slope? Solar radiation condition slope aspect is just one um, landscape aspect that comes to mind or the different moisture regimes in the landscape. Do you have a, a scheme for that? Uh, yeah, that, that is something I, I took in consideration this this place uh, where I did the analysis is pretty flat, so uh, it's more or less even. I think the difference in in a slope is about one meter, two meter, if I remember well. So it's quite uniform, uh, but I still need to run the analysis for the moisture and and check if that's gonna have some influence. Hope that answered the question. 
Yeah, thanks, Diego. So we have a question for uh, for you from Harrison. Yeah, Diego. <clears throat> so yep. last year, um, Craig Litticoat, um did a uh, rest uh, look at um, remnant vegetation and age and found a uh, a negative correlation with certain pathogenic, uh, pathogenic strains of um, bacteria to uh, taxa. Um, have you considered looking into that and doing something similar with your work when you start looking at the soil microbiome? Um, yeah, we... Just, just a recommendation, you might be able to get some extra added value add by looking to see if there's a similar correlation in grasslands as there is to remnant forest and revegetation of uh, forest and grasslands. It's, it's something to consider. Yeah, I think it would be good to look at it, although this system is supposed not to have many trees. Yeah. Uh, but for sure we want to do a genetic analysis to, to get an idea of the bacterial species that are there. Yeah. And we want to compare remnant grasslands, exarable lands, and see, and if possible, uh, different dips or depths, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so we want to check, uh, we aim to identify the, the original microbial compo uh, community. Yeah. That no, will that, be that, more linked to the native perennials, I think. Yeah, that, that that's obviously should be the, the primary, but you know, just potential value add. <laughs> okay. And, uh, take it easy, good talk. Thanks. Great, thanks Harrison. And Diego, can you tell us more about how you're going to assess the microbial community? What are the, what are the measures of community there that you're going to be using? Um, well, uh, I think the classic way to assess this is by, uh, there's a measure that you can take that is the microbial activity, if it increases or decreases, but that doesn't tell you much about the composition. So the phylogenetic analysis, the, the genetic analysis will be the, the best way to assess this. And we, you can see differences, how it changes with the different treatments. Yeah. Uh, so, the details of the test, I, I'm not so aware of, but we can work with the results. Uh, you can do diversity analysis on the results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're looking at um, using molecular techniques for that component. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Good, and do we have any other last questions for Diego? Apparently not. No, great, fantastic, great talk. Thank you, Diego, so. Thank you. Yeah, hands together, Whee! We need a screenshot of all the... <laughs> All right, fantastic.